Um, thanks everyone for being here. Obviously, some more people will um, trickle in as we as we move along here. Um, welcome to our fifth and final um, webinar in the Social Data in Action series. Hopefully, you've been at all of the other ones. And um, Amir, this is the culmination. So we're looking for something fabulous. No pressure. Um, yeah, so uh, it would be great to see your faces if you feel brave enough at any point and definitely at the end of the Q&A session. So let's move on, Paul. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge that I, uh, we are hosting or I am uh, located uh, hosting this webinar from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you're all working today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this webinar. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters. Okay, so Amir's going to speak for 25 to 30 minutes. Um, we do encourage you to uh, stack your questions into the chat as we go along. Um, and obviously we'll call for questions at the end, which we'd love you to put into the chat. And Anthony, if he ever makes his way <laughs> through Zoom and into this webinar, will be uh, managing the Q&A at the end. And we will be recording this session. So if you um, have any challenges or problems with that, please get in touch with Paul, paullavy at swinburne.edu.au. Um, I might start to uh, introduce Amir. So um, Amir Ariani is the head of the Social Data Analytics Lab in the Social Innovation Research Institute at Swinburne. Um, the lab applies contemporary and emerging co uh, cooperative data analytics techniques to provide insight into health and social problems. Amir is a computer scientist by background, and he has worked with uh, illustrious international institutions, including the British Library, ORCID, um, the Institution for Social Sciences in Germany and uh, on projects funded by ARC, NHMRC and the National Institutes of Health. I just wanted to note before Amir gets started that um, Amir is a great example, I think, of how community and social data projects and innovation benefit from a mixed team with a mix of different inputs on the team. So if anyone was present at Sarah Williams uh, talk recently in this webinar series, she noted how um, Project teams uh, should have data scientists, social science specialists, and lived experience. And a lot of our projects have uh, community organizations involved in them. So in this way, high quality social data projects become a space where the vital facets of knowledge are melded for innovation and insight. Um, so today, Amir is going to focus on our uh, innovative work with community data co-ops and collaboratives. Uh, I'm now officially handing over to you, Amir. Thanks, Jane. Thanks for the very nice introduction. Okay, let me test the technology. Uh, is, can everyone see my screen? That's good, thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, so, sure, thanks. So, uh, Following what Jane said, um, I'm planning to actually in the next 30 minutes give you a bit of background about Swinburne's venture into the data cooperative projects. But also I will tell you kind of an uh, overview of the toolbox of data science tools that we have available at Swinburne. And also this is a partnership with four other universities. So a lot of these tools and platforms that we're going to talk about they are available, uh, some of them in your institute directly or indirectly through your collaboration and um, uh, uh, kind of collaborative links. The, the concept of data co-ops has been something that's been around for a while, and but the, uh, the concept of data cooperatives basically. But in the context of this presentation, we are talking about the concept of data co-op more abstract as, a, as an element of bringing different data collaborative and data cooperations from different groups together. 
And uh, from that point of view, it's not just about data cooperatives as what we know as a form of organization, it's more about the concept of actually enabling collaboration between groups, teams, and communities. Now to start, let's talk about the couple of background things of how we got here. Uh, as Jane mentioned, my background is computer science. I have worked a lot in a different stores, worked with a, um, a scientists from the hydrogen physics to chemistry, to biology, to social science. And uh, now more than ever, we have access to the advanced data analytics capabilities in different fields. Uh, social science and humanities are the one that are um, kind of in a very interesting position. When we look at the commercial sector, there is a lot of data capabilities are there. Uh, when we look at the research sector in these domains, there are a lot to be desired. And I'll get to this in a moment. But in the commercial space, data analytics and AI now is, a, well, in the past, it used to be a game changer. Now it's an essential component. Like in 2018, I used to have this uh, quote about in five to 10 years, AI would be integrated part of a lot of different systems. Uh, given the pandemic, a lot of those things has been substantially accelerated and a lot of those things is already in place. The biggest changes that happened is the unstructured data previously working with that was a big challenge and the information was in silo, no, no they are all interconnected. If you scan a coffee cup image on your phone, the AI system underneath, it knows where you are standing in a, a coffee shop in a shopping center. It knows you have previously purchased uh, coffee from that coffee shop. And the, all of these elements come together to tell, okay, I know exactly this is the Starbucks coffee cup. So it provides a very, very high accuracy given other connected information. So uh, the two transition of unstructured data to the structured data and disconnected data to knowledge graph is now embedded into a lot of commercial platforms you're using. Um, the other concept that more and more get traction is a concept of augmented intelligence. That is bringing AI to the point of actually being an active assistant in a lot of day-to-day -day activities. The best um, kind of example of how this operates is that rather than AI drives your car, AI would tell you that you are going too fast. You need to turn right. You actually have you pay attention to road work ahead. It notes about the, uh, the different climates and if the road is raining and basically provides substantial assistance to the operation of the car. Same thing can happen in organization, already happening in a lot of commercial sector, in supply chains, in transport, in a lot of fields that enables effective decision-making. Now, these are all in the um, a big corporate space, but also a lot of activities happening in the social and urban uh, organizations. Um, across the globe, we have initiatives like uh, Nesta in Europe that works a lot with the platforms like Collective Intelligence and the uh, Open Data Platforms. There's a lot of effort around the data collaboratives in the United States. Uh, we have the Urban Institutes, uh, the Data Kind, and also in New Zealand, we have the Center for Social Data Analytics. In Australia, this uh, social data analytics lab or SODA lab, uh, we start doing work with the not-for-profit sector in creating similar capabilities. Uh, the main uh, driver was lifting up the data literacy and data capabilities in the sector. And that also signified that, well, there is, um, apart from the data skills, there's also lots of infrastructure components and the governance elements are missing. And that has been the motivation behind the whole data co-op platform. Now, what is data co-op platform? It's basically the methodology based on the idea that to create effective data projects that make a change. We, we need data, yes, of course, but that's not the only thing that we need. We need people, we need domain experts, data scientists, we need researchers. We need people who can actually transform data to the actionable insights. And they cannot do it by themselves. They actually need analytics capability. So that's where usually university come to play, but sometimes commercial providers. But the center point of a data co-op are actually people who make a difference, who make an impact using all the insights that they drive from the data sets. And during this course of projects that uh, we have done in the last couple of years, we kind of built a model that we said, like, if you need to do a trusted data partnership project that leads potentially to a data collaboration, 
you need the infrastructure that supports this. And that infrastructure talks about things like data storage and data access, it talks about artificial intelligence. It notes capabilities of how to dispose the sensitive data after finishing the project. We have the infrastructure, but we still need a data governance model. That is where we're dealing with the ethics problems. How do we actually manage the data life cycle? Answering to the questions like the risk management, five safes model, how do we actually make our data findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable data set or fair data? And these are the operation pillars, if you like, if you like from, um, from the concept of trusted data partnership. When you have them in place, then you can actually focus on the creating the data collaborative projects. And in that layer, in the data collaboration with a number of, number of different initiatives and concepts, we've named few of them here, like the knowledge transformation, coll uh, collective intelligence. This is the space that you can actually look at the data communities and also data cooperatives also goes into that layer. Now, um, I thought this is actually going to be useful to look at uh, different perspectives of communities regarding this, uh, the concern around data sharing. In 2019, we ran a workshop uh, in Canberra with a number of different government departments, not for profit sectors, researchers. Uh, the main question on the table and the round table discussion was about the responsible data sharing. And we had uh, in the room researchers who needed access to the data, but we also had a lot of data custodians, data providers. One of the things came out of that conversation uh, as we recorded, transcribe, and then analyze the text later on. And we also, in kind of, it was a two days workshop. So in the second day, we went back to them with the result of the analytics, was there is a lot of discussion around the data access. And this is not complaining about we want data, we don't actually have, we can't get access to the data. It was kind of other way around. A lot of data providers, they wanted to get their data reusable, usable, to drive value from it. And they wanted to provide data to the research sector and the uh, uh, commercial sector. The problem is there's always this kind of um, shroud of doubt about how do we actually make data reusable in an ethical way and how we can actually drive value from data without compromising the privacy and the security. So that has been one of topics of conversation. There was a lot of interest of making data uh, as a kind of first class citizen of the research and science. There are roadblocks to make that happening. And then when you kind of go past the ethical conversation around this, there's a lot of discussion around the governance and data linkage and data value by both sides of the part uh, of this conversation. Now, if you think about the government data, at the moment we have the five safe model in place. This is the model, um, uh, this is a recommendation by data commissioners in Australia, which basically says any data projects that wants to access, uh, um, wants to access the uh, government data should answer the risk assessment questions on five different uh, pillars or components. Uh, the first group is that, is it a safe project? So you have to justify that a project you are doing is a safe project. The second thing is that, are there a safe group of people who are running this project? Uh, then there's a safe settings that comes back to concern. Some data sets cannot be stored in servers overseas. Then there are the data security. Like this is kind of like, a, if everything goes fail, what do I need in the data to protect itself? Do I need the identification encryptions and so forth? And then the output, who's gonna manage the output of this? Now, this is a very good model to think about what can happen with a lot of our research projects uh, in the um, uh, university sector. This is not currently applied outside the government, but there's a lot of appetite for kind of expanding this model to the not-for-profit, to the commercial sector and to the, universe, uh, to the education sector. Um, this is also a very, um, kind of good segue to look at the risk assessment model. The risk assessment, the classical way of managing a risk of the data project usually comes from the likelihood of something bad happening uh, to the severity of the impact of that uh, problem. And this is kind of a classic model. When we look at all data projects, we look at the uh, data and output, both of them as a content that we need to manage the risk for that. Then there's the use cases that are settings of the project and the operation of this, and also the content of the project operation, and also the people who are involved. So we can look at the five safe concept 
in this way in, in, in a lot of research projects enable that conversation about is it a safe project to go ahead. Now, with all of that background, that is where we got to the idea of the data co-op platform. So we knew that uh, so a lot of our operation at Swinburne initially was based on the co-design model. And that was kind of a recipe to success for a lot of our projects. That was also the beginning of the concept of the data co-op. So we said, we want to create a uh, trusted data partnership and we want to create value out of it. We established a iterative model that in that iteration, we were actually reading information from different sources, from the government data to the not-for-profit sector, community data sets and the social media. We had a number of, we had a model for running a number of different co-design workshops when the data is actually answering specific questions. We are workshopping these with the community and project partners. We will get in their feedbacks. We send the feedback to the data engineers. And we basically from that conversation, we produce data products that later on lead to insights. Now this process, we will repeating these workshops again and again in order to basically provide the richer insights and more impactful, actionable insights. Now, the idea of the infrastructure was create the platform that enabled this, given all of the things that I mentioned as a requirements of a trusted data partnership. And this transformed to a uh, fund, uh, funded project by ARC Lift Grant. Uh, so Swinburne is leading the grant. Uh, AMU, Griffith, University of Melbourne, and UTAS are the partners. And we built a platform, I will uh, take you through that, that basically provides the capability for enabling these data co-op projects. Now, in the next couple of minutes, uh, I'm going to mainly focus on the data infrastructure activities. Because these, are the, these are kind of new components. In a lot of previous webinars, we talked about the in and out of the data governance and the challenges around collaboration. But the data infrastructure is kind of new from our uh, kind of uh, operation point of view. We almost finished developing a lot of components and now they are at the point of providing service to our projects. So this part is the one that kind of, um, if you like, are the shiny objects in our toolbox. Uh, we are going to talk about artificial intelligence, data visualizations, and some of the other elements that enable these uh, components that come together, such as data access and data linkage model. Now, we have the hybrid data co-op infrastructure today based on the need and requirements for a system. I know this has looked like a, a quite a techy perspective of the whole different things goes together. Uh, this is actually one of our interesting, that's not one of our internal documents. And there is a tool we are using that transforms 2D to 3D. So we have a 2D version of this that we use for a kind of status checking of our servers. And then this produces nice 3D visualization. Uh, but it also has uh, some important essence of how the operation divided to different layers. So we have the social media layer of data that we are managing and running and collects continuous information from the media and social media. We have the public data layer as gateways to main government and uh, education sector data sets uh, or, or in platforms, the ABS data sets, the data.gov. And then we have the secure data layers that predominantly running on Azure cloud. And that's been quite a good instrument to basically enable a lot of data co-op projects we are running, uh, which I will mention this, this was quite essential to actually um, create, curate, and hold data in a secure environment that can be used for producing insights. Uh, without going through the detail of this, the main function of a lot of these boxes is that make the unstructured data to the structured data and connect that information together and provide a tools for us to create data insights out of the mishmash of ideas and lots of different disconnected information. Uh, for example, one of the things that we have in our secure data space is that we are plugged into the cognitive search from Azure. So when we get the audio files uh, or we get the PDF files, we basically transform those information to text and then provide knowledge graph from the content of the text. So that provides uh, analyzable material out of the unstructured information. And we also have a secure space when we actually get information from our clients or partners, we can actually store them in information that is disposable at the end of the project or securely archivable, depends on the process that we'll um, confirm in the ethics. Now, a lot of these infrastructures at the end produce two main front end. Uh, either we produce uh, analytics dashboards, I will show you one of those, or we produce Jupyter notebooks that basically shows exactly 
what information has drive to what kind of insights and how we actually can walk back into those process really in the interest of reproducibility of the science, but also for any fact checking, if you need to know exactly how we got to a given number. Now, a data insight that we kind of get out of this system usually connects to multiple different elements. So it is linked to original data source. It links to a software that actually drives the data insight is exactly tell us how we got from the data source to a, a data set. It, it produced a transformed data set that often is a result of the work. And I'll show you uh, some of the, uh, these um, kind of transformation in a minute. It connects to the organizations that are linked to that data insight. It tells you what other publications are linked to this and who are the researchers. And in our ecosystem, everything is linked to ORCID and DOI. So this is quite a good transparency of this connected graph. Now, these are some of the examples of public insights. One of the things I mentioned, if you remember, everything comes out of the Azure. It's kind of like a private data insights. So it's come from a private data sources. So I'm not going to present those. I'm just going to go for the public insights that from the course of our data projects has been useful to our partners. So these are some of the examples that you can see. They are actually our open source code. You can go to the GitHub and you can see how the code it runs. For example, uh, this is the insight we derived from the AIHW public data set relates to the mental health services. We know more than 38% of Australians uh, in their survey actually contacted mental health services during 2018. Now, when you look at the insight like this, you know exactly where the data came from. So you know the source of data. Um, you would see the transformation of this. You see the visualization and basically is not just a text, it is all the steps that takes you to that uh, kind of fact. And that is quite important for a lot of projects. As the times goes on, we often would wonder around it. Well, how did we got to this statistic? And this process actually answers that question. Now, as exciting as Jupyter Notebooks are for data scientists, it's not always useful for everyone. So to make it more useful, we have the visualizations and data dashboards like this. It's kind of one of our other projects with the uh, with Bendigo. And same data sets just transform to a data visualization. This is run on top of the Power BI and again connects to our kind of Azure infrastructure. That's where we see the access of people to internet in Bendigo. And um, basically this tells us the story that about 20% 20 per, 20 of people uh, that are in the city of Bendigo, they have no access to the internet in 2016. That's based on the survey done in that time. But you can also see this one in different suburbs and uh, different areas in Bendigo on the right. So the graph that you see on the right, the red bar is the number of people who don't have access to the internet compared to the uh, kind of red and yellow together as a total population of that area. So this is much more tangible for people in Bendigo. And when we run workshops, they actually work with this. So kind of like there are two phases in this one. The Jupyter Notebooks is a quick way of producing insights. And this is the one that we take to a lot of, a lot of our workshops. Now, thinking about the, I initially promised to talk about AI. So just in the risk of getting more technical, we, we use AI to actually tell us what data sets are actually linked together. So there's so many ways to link information together. One of them is that using the place-based concept. There are different social variables or incidents that happens in different area that AI can actually find correlation. This is a lot of different social variables. And when you see blue here, it tells us people or characteristics of two different variables that live together. For example, the chance of having a high income and having three different cars, yeah, maybe. How about home ownership and having two or three cars? What about your jobs and the chance of renting? And this information using the power of AI can be calculated in so many different ways in all different uh, kind of spatial lenses, like from the suburbs to states, to, uh, to country, to uh, different regional areas. So you can basically look for all the different permutations of potential connections of different communities together. And we have done this uh, in a kind of bigger scale. Uh, I'll show you the result of that. Uh, but potentially it provides us some insights. Like when we were doing a projects in the uh, city of Glen Ira at the time, we found very interesting patterns between the different um, industries that people work in and different uh, 
uh, kind of dependencies that they had to different social services and the number of cars that they own or the uh, uh, ownership of their properties. And some of those may or may not produce valuable research outputs, but for the policymakers and actual um, uh, commu uh, the not for profit organizations in that area, they're quite insightful in providing the right services to the right people. Now, when we put this into action, this is kind of picture of Victoria and using the same model. Uh, we kind of ask AI to tell us what are the communities living here. And AI kind of gave us this colorful pictures of different uh, groups. We didn't know in the beginning what they are and who they are. We give them some names, like the green ones are, we call them CBD, since most people living here are in the high rise buildings and they're renting, there are a lot of them are students, but they're not just in Melbourne CBD, I mean the Boxhill areas and the uh, left side of the map, right side of the map, you can see there are other CBD type of structures with those green boxes uh, in that area. I just want to take your attention to two of the big major communities. Like we have identified the orange ones as a sort of area that have high incomes, families living there are mostly, there are in the kind of age range of 40 to 54. And then they have um, uh, teenagers between the five to 19. Uh, unlikely that you find people in this area that are 25 to 34, they move to other suburbs. And they, uh, unlike it, they have moved recently, so they're established. They have high education, they're professionals, and they're in managerial jobs. When you look at the other one, the purple one, uh, all po population almost double, the orange area. These are a lot of areas full of uh, high level of um, immigration. People came from overseas. Uh, and compared to the uh, orange area, they have a lower median income. Um, also, they're less likely to be aged 55 to 69. And uh, they're more established, they haven't moved their house, but they're more likely to rent. And uh, interesting enough, they're less likely to engage in volunteer work. So there are lo lots of different variables that you can look for people living in different areas. Now, this is just one slice and I think there would be many other ways that we can do this with different focuses. Uh, and also this is just one data set. So there are different layers of data set you can add to basically achieve this kind of computation. Now, um, we transform similar information to 3D visualization. This is one of the capabilities we have in the data co-op platforms. It get the data and basically produce 3D maps. We have a pipeline for it. Uh, the data cleaning is still quite mechanical and done manually. Okay. This is always the most expensive part of a lot of our projects, but then the remaining of these things are automated. Also, it's a good time to mention that these multiple data layers are very, very important, both in projects and at the infrastructure layer. For like this is, for example, a screenshot from some of our vulnerability layers that we have for one of our projects. You can see there are different data sets and they can be enabled in different ways to provide information to the, uh, um, uh, to the participants in a data co-op project. But also these layers and the combination of them can feed to the AI for the clustering that I mentioned. So this kind of like providing both for the human users to understand what is happening and also for AI to provide that kind of augmented intelligence. Now, speaking about the social media that I mentioned earlier, that is another source of information that we have available for a lot of our projects. We have, uh, uh, I think at the moment, we have more than 2 billion tweets in our data lake. And uh, this is just one of our projects that uses the bushfire data that has 700,000 tweets uh, we collected in a, a specific period of time uh, that's all related to the bushfire happened in um, kind of East Coast. And I think it started from Victoria. Uh, all of this information are analyzable in so many different ways and are accessible through machine driven API, but also they have dashboards like this that you can query the data and read it and pull in information from the system. We also have access to the commercial Twitter API, which enable us to actually for given project run a specific queries and basically get the archive of the entire Twitter data in the last 10 years and find out exactly, for example, how many people tweeted about the government policies around COVID-19 in different areas. And that information can be mapped effectively and provide uh, that kind of uh, specific lens for a place-based research. Now I mentioned briefly the secure virtual machines and secure data access. That's one of the boxes in our kind of ecosystem. Well, one thing we have done is that the secure data is essential for working with the sensitive data. Uh, 
So when we have sensitive information, one of the problems we historically had was people putting this in their notebook and they walk around. And if you lose a notebook, you're actually potentially losing the sensitive information on your hard drive. Well, now that we have this pipeline, we also created a virtual machine on the cloud that has all the data analytics tools readily available from the Python to the graph database to machine learning tools. It provides one of the key functionality for the people or staff who are using this is that they basically have the uh, work resume at any time that they want. It's just sitting on a cloud. When they turn it on, it's immediately available. When they kind of finish their work, they can just turn off their notebook, but this doesn't have to turn off the machine. But it also enables us that basically have that bubble of data and compute in one place. And when the project is over, we can either archive it or dispose it. So it's very much at, um, kind of provide the assurance that data is not going to leak uh, or get lost. Also provides another function and that's for the projects that are have a longevity of that, we have that rich reproducibility of the data science. We can always go back to the same environment. The code is there so we can actually rerun it and we basically get the data in place. Now there is a lots of sensitive data platforms in Victoria funded by Australian Research Data Commons and other groups around the medical health this is not up to data standard. It provides our needs. Like it's not really designed for working with uh, um, interconnectivity and interoperability with other systems like hospitals. This is, this is just a space, a secure space and very effective model for working with a sensitive data that lands into our ecosystem. Now, a quick uh, note about the data co-op projects that we are running and experience that we got from them. Uh, so, just one of the examples, we recently had a, a work with basically three um, not-for-profit organization as part of the funding by Lord Mayor Char Charitable Foundation. The data project that we have run here is uh, started from the concept of working with the local data to produce insights. And this was also a close um, ecosystem work with all the domain experts from those organizations and our data science team to look at the public and private data sets to say, well, okay, we, we have all of these data sets. What does it actually tell us? Uh, it was a quite a good data exploration exercise that led to a very actionable insights for the organization uh, participating in this exercise. It also provided a good way for us uh, to understand what are the requirements for the uh, small to medium enterprises to actually engage in data projects. So previously we had a lot of experience with the local governments and bigger organizations uh, like Red Cross. This was the exercise at the uh, more contained level. And one of the things that we learned from this exercise was there is a lot of value in the public insights. So a lot of information that we actually search and kind of curate for them, uh, they are coming from the public sources. So yes, the private sources are very useful and we got a lot of insights from those. Unfortunately, I cannot share those insights in this presentation since they are private and coming from the secure data sets. But these are the example from the private information that we kind of during the lifetime of those projects we drive that we found out, uh, for example, people who are earning between 2000 and 3000, they are uh, basically driving around or commuting around 20 kilometers in Australia. Now, interesting enough, if you make more than 3,000 per week, then you actually drive or commute less based on the ABS data. We looked at information related to the um, mental health and anxiety. For example, we found that uh, about 32% of uh, females reported experiences some kind of anxiety at some part of their life. It's all data back to 2007, but given the nature of the insight that has been valuable for the, uh, for the partners in the project. The same thing about the disability and so forth. Uh, and we are basically during the lifetime of those workshops, we produce a number of these insights for the group. This is one of the examples of the private insights that is not very sensitive. So that talks about the good cycle and we map their information using the engines that we have. And we found that uh, they are basically, they, uh, in the way that they measure uh, the travel distance of their staff, they have basically contributed more than $4,000 to the community based on this saving transport time on the staff. Basically the way that Good Cycle works is that they send, uh, um, they send services to different areas and they're very much focusing and hiring 
uh, younger people and basically make them um, kind of job ready if you like for the society so in that context one of the things they were looking at was all the travels of these people do and the way that services that they provide now lessons learned from this particular type of projects and also the infrastructure that we are running um, well the first thing was with on data acquisition and data cleaning is the most expensive component and that's not a surprise for uh, industry to a great degree but i think for education sector that's uh, to some level uh, it's to some level it was surprising uh, the other thing that we found is that and we knew this from the beginning so it's kind of like a firm or kind of initial understanding that data collaboration is an iterative process so you don't get the data you analyze it and write a paper or give it to the client and walk away so it needs to be done in an iterative process that you continuously working with them and you you refine the result you get their insight you go back the data sets you basically build a pipeline of uh, data human interaction in a way that actually produce value from data. The other thing is that data visualization is, that's not the goal, but that is what make a difference to transform data to the actionable insights. Without visualization, you just have data that no one understands and no one uses. Uh, we also found that there's a great value in public data sets. I cannot uh, emphasize that enough. And there has been a lot of investment in Australia around the reusability of research data. And um, there is a, there's a lot of kind of um, efforts and activities by different groups to kind of tap into the existing data sets rather than collecting the information again and again. And our, whole, our, our own journey is kind of uh, highlighting the same thing, that looking at existing data sets, reusing them can provide a lot of value for the research and for the not-for-profit sector. And finally, data linkage is what you need to do for a lot of projects. But a lot of times, the only way to connect data set together is based on the sense of place. So if you aggregate information for a given area, then understanding of correlation of different phenomena and social variables in a given space, that is the best way of looking at the connection between information. And that is what we use for a lot of our kind of uh, um, collaborative exercises to bring information from different partners, from different organizations together. I think on that note, that was, uh, I think I can kind of finish this presentation and uh, I, I can just say that this has been so far an amazing journey. There is a lot of capabilities here at Swinburne and also across all of our partners. If you have projects that you think um, can benefit from some of these, I will definitely want to hear from you and work with you. Uh, Jane has been quite effective and amazing going around and found all of kind of different projects that we are keep doing and keep us always busy and we don't complain. So if, if you have something that you want to collaborate with us, yes, raise your hand. On that note, I can just pass the microphone back to Jane and Paul. Thank you. Anthony, I think, is in charge of this next bit. Sure, I can. I will um, help to coordinate questions and um, please feel free to, to add a question either in the chat or raise your hand um, through the participants tab. Do you want to exit the screen sharing, Amir, just so that we can see each other, each of us a little bit better? Um, and yeah, very, very welcome, um, very much welcome anyone to, to jump in with a question um, if you want to know a little bit more or if you have um, thoughts of your own in working with um, data in this way. Um, I have questions, I always have questions. Um, so I'm just gonna kick off because I, I, get to, I, I get to decide who asks the first question. So, um, <laughs> so I'm just jumping in. Um, it's so, so one of the, the things that we always find frustrating, Amir, and I'm, I'm wondering if you can just tell us a little bit more about your experience in this space. Um, you're talking about the, the difficulties in the, in the sort of I guess, operational layer with partner organizations um, coming together and working together uh, in, in the process of sharing data, but also looking for what kind of insights might be shared insights, not just um, insights that will help their organization specifically or their mission, et cetera. Um, I have a bunch of questions around that, um, you know, particularly in terms of the difficulties in in building trust and and building um, uh, data agreements, um, and 
also, so, but the question that I'm, I'm kind of interested in at the moment um, is what you think about the, the increasing role of data stewards or data custodians in these organisations, people who, um, you know, seem to take responsibility or are um, most interested in, um, you know, pushing forward with data projects and, yeah, what your experience has been around that. I mean, that was a very, very long set of questions. <laughs> I, I, as if I remember, I start from the back <laughs> going forward. So uh, in the stewardship positions um, and data custodians, I think one of the problems that we had with a lot of projects is when we start um, engagement with the organization, doesn't matter if it's like government departments or even a small SME, there's always a shroud of mystery of what data do they have and who owns the data and how we can actually access that information. That is one of those areas that when we start a project, often even at the sign on signing the contract, we don't know what it is. Now you're right, as we actually start tapping to those data sets, then it's different interests or sometimes competing interests start to bubble as people start to share given data sets. So that in a way you would always have influencers in those workshops and those conversations that try to actually um, take the directions of, if you like, the whole workshop, take the direction of the conversation. And there is, this is, uh, this is not new to the concept of research. It's actually new to the, uh, even in the commercial sector that is given that anyone who shared a resource would have kind of agenda attached to it. Now in the context of universities, partner with industry, this almost gets a bit more complicated because you often operate as a kind of like you're providing research services. And then that puts us in a very strange position because in one way they expect us to kind of uh, be fair and do the ethical research at the other side there are components underneath moving around that make things difficult because there are different, um, different rules and different uh, expectations goes with it. Now it's, this is something that we deal with this, and I don't think you have experience in doing this a lot. We, we deal with this often during those workshops. So often during the workshop, that is where the main work happens, that we basically try to showcase different features and take attention of people in different facts. But end of the day, a lot of people management involved in actually coordinating those activities. Now, one step back before in this is that we need to sign those data sharing agreement and lease documents and contracts. And that is the most complicated part of it because we often get into a lots of challenges and difficulties around accessing to a given data sets when it gets to the legal requirements. And those requirements often come with the expectations attached to it. And that's, that's usually is the most complicated process for projects like this. So I don't know how much I managed to go into the depth of the questions that you ask. If I forgot right. something, let me know. No, absolutely. Um, there's a, qu a question from Paul. Um, I'm not sure if you want to jump on Paul and, and yes. ask the question, but the, it's it's a pretty quick question. Yeah, Paul. I'm just happy to do it. I, I was very keen since the um, the Australian Research Data Commons and the federal government's initiatives around uh, e humanities research infrastructure or digital humanities research infrastructure. Infrastructure. What it, this has obviously been going for some while. How? Have you had any connections with that and some of the initiatives that are starting to be put forward? Yes, that's right. Thanks, Paul. That's actually a very good question. So interesting enough, actually, the first component of this project was funded by ARDC. So we are closely working with them. Uh, some of the uh, components around the data governance of this project has been done in a direct consultation with ARDC. So they're quite involved in that data governance layer process that you're establishing. And in the infrastructure layer, we are quite connected to the increased facilities. We are working with the ADA, uh, Australian Data Archive. We are working with ORIN in that space. We're getting information from ORIN into our system. And also we are working with the, uh, the, this uh, kind of increased facilities and on the concept of the has common infrastructure. So in that way, we are quite aware of the sector and we're working with the players in that domain. Also, all the DOIs that are minted out of our system all coming from the ARDC services. Okay, so... A couple of, couple of thanks, questions. Um, Lee, it's a long question there, I think. Did you want to jump on and, and ask that one? 
Uh, yes, we have the frustration in a cross-border community, Albury Wodonga, which really operates as one community, but it's just it's so incredibly diff difficult to, to um, get simple uh, data that, that tells you basic things. Like I saw a presentation the other day on Victorian breast screen uh, participation data for the catchments that we serve in Victoria. And there was an assumption made from that data that the, the rates in, um, in Wodonga and Indigo might be lower than the state averages in Victoria because people were going to New South Wales. But you shouldn't really draw that conclusion unless you can test that assumption with the New South Wales uh, equivalent data to know where people are coming from. And that's just a small example of uh, a zillion things every day that uh, are very frustrating in this community. So my question is probably really about just the, the model that you're using, um, that overlay, would that sort of be applicable in an environment like this or have you come across those sort of issues before? So maybe you mentioned two different things. So let me just rephrase this just to be sure that if I understand your question correctly. So the first thing is that you kind of had a problem of accessing the data in a complete form. It's almost kind of like mm -hmm. a, small, a small slice of data that doesn't tell you the whole story. And the other thing is that looking at all the different data sets from other sources that they can basically provide the big picture. Is that what we are? Yes, those two things. That's very good summary, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, on the first one, I this is one of the classic risk of data science. It's almost like a, in, if it was a biology concept, thinking about the, we're taking very, very small sample tests and then drive a conclusion and say, well, this drug is very safe because we just had like five people testing that all of them had no problem and then apply this to a, a one billion people. And that's a, that's a classic example. In data science, you want a data set that it is complete and it is, uh, it is based on normal distribution has been coll uh, collected correctly and basically provides the uh, coverage around the majority of cohort or population that are subject of that study. Uh, I remember without mentioning the name, I was in one of the workshop presentation, one of the commercial providers and they had a data set about Australia. So I asked to zoom into a given area. At that time, we had a project at the city of Glen Ira and I found that, well, actual number of people in that area who have answered to that survey are only two. You don't drive information or any conclusion about the whole community with just two people. So uh, this is this is a this is a very huge risk around the social science because it's not recognized as much as it's been recognized in the biology and health and other sectors that a lot of papers in the social science get reviewed and you look at the sample size it's like been like 1,000 people that answer the survey and then drive the conclusion. If you have a similar drug test example, is not going to get approved in any shape or form, or the paper is not going to get published. So this is one of the problem, and part of the reason is that data collection in social science is complicated. Now, the problem that you mentioned is a slightly different. It sounds like you have a problem in the area to actually access the right data set. Now, the other thing is that this overlaying data sets from other sources is definitely the way to go. In a lot of ways, we use a concept that's called proxy data. I may not have access to the information about people commuting in a given area, but I might be able to access the petrol uh, uh, purchases and uh, kind of the energy consumption in that domain. So that can be something I can proxy to find out the usage of car. Uh, this is an example of information can be used in different ways to actually drive conclusion about things that we don't have data about. It's not a, it, it, this by itself is a very risky activity because using the wrong proxy, you might drive a wrong conclusion, but it is a way to actually kind of uh, cover the gap. Can I just say as well that it's lovely to see you again, Lee Road, <laughs> um, and uh, that this whole kind of issue of like rural areas data is something we're really, really interested in. Um, and, and we have kind of dabbled with this kind of data bricolage kind of concept, which is like chucking in all the data sets that you can get to see if you can get some, some findings, to put it kind of crudely. Um, because, because of what Abir said, that there's often small numbers across massive areas. But I also uh, get what you're saying about borders, right? Because you've got different data sets and different ways of collecting the data sets and different accessibility of the data sets. So I think 
that what Amir is saying about like looking at other data sets that might that we might use together is probably a way that we could go or that you could go ahead. Yeah. And also one thing else mentioned to mention it might be useful. Sometimes the data from the other sources provide a very, very important complementary part of the picture. Like example of this in uh, urban area is a homelessness data. If you look at just one um, uh, local government, you might have a, a picture that relates to their services. But if you look at all the other neighboring uh, LGAs, then you actually see potentially different stories given that people who are dealing with that problem moving from area to area. So that's uh, sometimes in some, some of these data co-ops, it's actually a necessity of getting the data from multiple different sources, especially with gets to the geographical area to get a better picture. Jane, did you want to add your additional question that you popped in the chat as well? I have more too, so. Anyone? Oh, well, I just, um, I, I'm just conscious that the talk maybe sounded like, oh my God, how would we even start doing this? So, um, but by the same token, I know that we have started at, at point zero or scratch with a number of organizations. So I wanted, I wanted to make it seem not super scary. Um, so uh, my question, Amir, is like, how, what advice would you give to a small organization that maybe didn't have specialist workforce, but was really interested in trying to look at um, what extra value they might get from the data that they collect? Uh, so the, 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 there are two different things that might help them. One is that the old infrastructure that I mentioned that are basically we did the engineering work. So it actually make it extremely simple for people to go to data co-op workshop to make those data products and insight happening. So I think all the things that I mentioned, it's kind of running behind me and that you are actually running a not-for-profit organization running, tries to do a data project, not even data co-op projects, just a data project. And this is, you won't, be, you won't see all of these infrastructures uh, detail you just see that okay, all of these insights and services are just working and that's the intention of this the other thing is that uh, as we have done the, uh, the the my example around the urala and um, good cycles and the other uh, projects i mentioned they are started in that context of being small data co-ops with a small number of data sets and it grew very gradually now the, the, the recipe for this is that those workshops are very good um, uh, vessel in a way to get to a bigger plan. So you start with a small project, you basically go into a number of different iterations, but confined in a, like three or five months. And then you basically from those, you would have a much better understanding about what is possible. And I think that is a, that is a very good opening for any data project in that space. Just start in a small pilot space when it's manageable and produ produce some, uh, useful but limited number of insights and that is kind of give first give a taste about what can happen but also it provides insight about what is possible and that's where you can plan and go ahead. Um, there's a question here Amir from from Aaron um, and it's a really good question because we're, we've just started a project where it's it's about um, those connections between data sets within government and, and access um, you know, across government departments where there, there is essentially a goodwill to, to data sharing, but still a lot of concern and a lot of, um, a lot of issues around trust in, in that sense. Erin, did you want to ask your actual question? Oh, thanks, Anthony. That's a great intro. It's really about whether or not we can piggyback off these previous successes in passing the five safes type risk assessment check uh, when the next um, data opportunity comes along to access um, state or Commonwealth government data sets. So, you know, does it stand us in good stead? Is there a way we can lever those past successes in or do we just have to go the rounds and complete those processes every time? Uh, so Erin, I'm not actually aware of a formal process for this. So government right now, the federal government look at the process of kind of crediting different organizations to access to the sensitive data from government, but that's not based on five safe models. That's much more kind of um, 
um, detailed verification of organization's capabilities. Now, when it gets to the fire safe, at the moment, it's still it is sitting at a level of recommendation. It's not implemented as, uh, it is a framework, but it's not detailed framework enough that you say, I'm gonna pass these things by basically going through these steps one at a time. And as a result of this, then, as you said, you're doing, you're passing this again and again for every data projects, for every single data sets. There's no record of it somewhere to say, look, well, I've done a five set project for this project, it's safe. So I can have to go, I can, it's not like ethics that you've done the ethics and then you go and access many different data sets. It's a conversation to have for every data set at every government department. And I know this is frustrating and expensive to do, but at least is provide a framework because previously we even didn't have that. Like we were talking to different data custodian and they were not even, they didn't know what questions even to ask. So at least there are now a way to communicate and a way to actually ask the right questions. But unfortunately there's no way to record or reuse the answer to those questions. Um, just building on that, Amir, um, there's, uh, you know, a lot of a, a lot of uncertainty, I guess, but also interest in in how we do move from principles to um, to clear processes around ethical questions, and and I guess some ethical issues in dealing with with um, with data at the say the community sector level, um, health sector level, etc., outside of government. Um, for for example, and I'm just I'm just kind of wondering about your thoughts on whether or how you know you see um, building those ethical questions into the design around the you know the data engineering side of things, the the kind of work that you would want to do in the background um, in order to set up those processes smoothly. But how do we build ethical um, practice in at that level? So there is a there is established practice of the research data management that taps into the very superficial level of this conversation. So what do you do with the data in a sense that follow those rules, but doesn't actually answer the question that what rules apply to so those would be dynamic from project to project. But that was a whole idea of a trusted data partnership model. This is the idea of that model that we follow. We try to actually kind of build a well, so far we have kind of built it into our infrastructure, but we're also trying to produce that governance model into this sort of practice question. So following what just Erin asked, we don't want to actually get the same problem in, internally in our own ecosystem. So if we know what questions to ask and if we know what rules to follow and if we know what procedures needs to be in place to cater for different type of projects, the preferred model would be at least um, probably automating is a wrong term, but put them in a rail in a way that you know exactly what needs to go where uh, for a different type of question. Kind of a decision tree in that way. So that is the intention with what we are dealing with. I still, as probably mentioned in a part of the presentation, we are building the building blocks. So what you've seen today are the kind of building blocks of the much bigger plan. Uh, and we are almost like people sitting in a house, but at the same time, we are building the house. So it's, it's kind of, uh, we don't have a luxury of just going out in a tent and just build a house and then move in. We're just sitting here and Jane comes with different questions, Anthony comes with the questions and we have questions, uh, so the projects and we have projects from all different parts of uh, Swindon or uh, partnership networks. And as we are actually going through these projects, we're putting these things together. So the house is getting built together in at the live time. And uh, there is always the drawbacks and there was a lot of redone work needs to happen. Uh, but also the advantage is that everything you're building is 100% applied because you're just, you, you drive by the usage of those. You're not building something and then cut the ribbon and then they start using that to figure out, oh, that was a mistake. We find mistakes much earlier. That's in some way saves money. Um I'm just conscious of time. We do have one um, very big question right at the end there from Fiona, but I, I think we don't have quite enough time to answer that question, which is really about you know um, where this can leave us with um, with really big you know issues around data leaks and and um, data security. And I think that's that's partly addressed by um, you know your your approach to um, 
uh, private and secure platforms as well as open um, and public um, platforms for data sets as well. Um, but I just want to um, thank you, Amir, for your time today. And um, thanks everyone for coming and for the insightful questions. I hope that um, this has been a, a fruitful series for everyone. We've had um, some really great seminars, I think, in the Social Data in Action uh, seminar series. And this was a really great way to end it, I think, because it was very practical. Um, and these are projects that, um, that Amir and the team and, and we are all implementing, um, working with nonprofits and um, health sector and um, government uh, public sector. Uh, so thanks everyone for, for your involvement. Have a look for the videos um, via the, the Social Innovation Research Institute website um, and or Swinburne Commons, as well as the um, Center of Excellence for Automated Decision Making and Society's YouTube channel. Please like and, and subscribe. And uh, we hope to see you in, in further webinars. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Jane. And thank you, everyone, for joining the presentation.